so lovely of all of you to come. So wonderful to see so many familiar faces. And um, uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for everyone who's joining online. So I, yes, I will talk about the Lord's Resistance Army um, and about the piece of work that I produced from this. And Rebecca very rightly pointed out that it took me a long, long, long time to end up at this place where I can now talk about this in a published book form. And maybe some of the complications that I will talk about will indicate why I found that so difficult to struggle with this really complex, violent, and ultimately also very human conflict that I'm going to talk about. And there are many, many ways to tell this story about the Lord's Resistance Army. And today, you get my way, and you get a, a glimpse of my way. And there are many other ways. One really prominent way is this one, which I always highlight for American audiences, because some of you might remember this, that 10 years ago, this wave of a viral video swept through the country called Coney 2012, which was kind of a social movement, very prominent at the time on American college uh, campuses, started by an organization called Invisible Children, who in a very kind of unlikely way, not only was it one of the really first um, viral videos of that sense, Gangnam Style came shortly after and overtook <laughs> it, but, but it was a really unusual thing to happen because it was a, a, a video, the video is very, very controversial, I'm not going to go into this uh, today, which talked about this, Amer uh, this African warlord, gener generically African, who needed to be stopped. And it was implied that the way to stop him, it was very personalized, was through action, social action and demonstrations and so on in the United States, including outside the White House where I went and I attended that particular protest outside the White House. And it was this huge movement that had merchandise of many different kinds. And the call for Coney 2012 was to stop Coney and arrest him. And so this, is, this was very much one way to, to tell the story of the LRA that it was this, this one madman that needed to be stopped. That is not my way of telling the story. I start in a completely different slot. And I start in a slot fairly recently. This is a picture from last year. And this is a gentleman called Dominic Ongwen. And the picture that you see here is Dominic Ongwen at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And he is just about to be sentenced for, I think, what in the end was something like 31 counts. I'm not entirely sure, actually of crimes against humanities. Um, and he was sentenced to 25 years and this is currently in, in appeal. Dominic Ongwen was one of the commanders of the Lord's Resistance Army. And there's a very complicated story of how he ended up being in The Hague for the International Criminal Court. This was a very important trial. It was a very kind of landmark setting trial. It was also a very controversial trial. Again, controversies I won't go into too much today, but mainly controversial because Dominic and when himself kind of exemplified this issue of being a victim perpetrator, he himself was abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army when he was probably around nine years old and in a way had never known anything else. But what, I come, what I'll talk about in, in today is the inner logic of the LRA, of what it means to be part of a, an armed group that is seen and is extremely violent, is perceived as, a, as essentially an incarnation of the devil and what it means to grow up in that inner logic where the thinking is much more about culture and resistance. And so, of course, the, the trial was very much based on, the defense was based on the idea that Dominic Ongwen himself was, was a victim. Um, and because the trial was so controversial, it was very easy to forget why Dominic Ongwen ended up there in the first place, because it was, it was kind of unusual. You know, he'd spent his entire life literally in the bush, somewhere on the borders, I'll show you a map in a second, of Uganda, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, the, the Central African Republic. And all of a sudden he was here. And the reason why he was there was because other attempts to spend, to, to end the violent conflict that involved the Lord's Resistance Army against the government of Uganda had failed. And the most prominent of these attempts was something called the Juba Peace Talks, which is exactly what I'm going to talk about. And it's important to keep in mind how important the Juba peace talks really were. The Juba peace talks were the first peace talks ever conducted with a group of people who had arrest warrants issued against them by the International Criminal Court. They kind of exemplified this tension that is often shorthanded by saying peace versus justice. It was also then, you know, later on, the first kind of peace effort that was, that had this viral video from a completely left field source. Um, and it was also a very unusual in the sense that the UN got involved and a very, very high level senior UN official actually met with the leaders of the armed group, which is not something that the UN normally does. So you can see already that there were new rules being established while all rules were also being broken. 
that is what happened before this picture. I'm going to take you back to a very different time, which is when Dominic, who's here on the my left, um, had long hair. He didn't speak any English yet because he'd only ever been in the bush. And he is sitting here in this photograph, which is a photograph that I took with the second in command of the Lord's Resistance Army, Vincent Oti. And this was a time during the peace talks taken in about 2007. This was a time, and this is important, before Twitter, before smartphones. So everything that was happening in these peace talks, which again, I'll give you more detail in a second, was kind of secretive. And it was very, very difficult for Dominic, who was a field commander of the Lord's Resistance Army, passing through a lot of these countries that I had just mentioned to communicate with his commanders. They needed to either send somebody as a runner to sometimes walk for months to then get to the command center, get some command, bring it back, or they needed to have satellite phones, which were very hard to come by and cost a dollar a minute. So this is, an, in a way, a very, very different time. It's also a time just before the US Army established its permanent command center in Africa, AFRICOM. So military presence was quite different. And it was also, and this is crucial because this is maybe not, that's an overhang, a time when peacemaking was really still very much understood to be rooted in Cold War's ideas, right? And the idea that you have these two opponents and they kind of fight across the trench and then somehow you enter negotiations and game theory kicks in and that's how you get, you know, you create incentives and that's how you get to peace. And then all of a sudden along comes the Lord's Resistance Army and it's very, very clear that none of that actually are very um, applicable ways of thinking about it. It was also a time before South Sudan was South Sudan. It was still part of Sudan. And this is where a lot of the, um, the negotiations happened in a kind of blip, in a complete coincidence of history, because Sudan had signed its internal peace agreement in 2005, which had created this interim semi-autonomous region in the South, which was by all means being set up to become its own country, but hadn't yet signed any international treaties. So this interim semi-autonomous government of South Sudan actually was in a position to say, you know, those arrest warrants of the International Criminal Court, we're not part of this. So we can actually go and we can facilitate peace talks with this very, very um, notorious um, group. It's also a time where the, the International Criminal Court is still in its, in its infancy. It had just come into action five years prior, four years prior. It was already clear that it became very quickly a very controversial institution. This is a picture of the person who was then the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Louis Moreno Campo. People in my qualitative class have met him yesterday, um, not in person, but in storytelling. And he's shaking hands with President Museveni of Uganda, who's still president of Uganda, in a way that is controversial, politically very controversial. The International Criminal Court is supposed to be an independent institution, not politicized. The government of Uganda, the army of Uganda was very much part of this particular conflict. So to see the chief prosecutor who's about to prosecute or issue arrest warrants for one conflict party being very chummy with one of the others is, is very, very complicated and kind of expresses um, what, how difficult this was, this, this establishment of the International Criminal Court. So why, why all this attention? So I want to talk to you a little bit and give you background a little bit on the Lord's Resistance Army and also particularly on this man, on Joseph Connie, who is the coin really correctly pronounced, who is the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army. And I give you a short history of the conflict in a way it's very often told, this story, which is that the Lord's Resistance Army came out of really a very tumultuous political time in Uganda in 1986 and very quickly became a brutal and ruthless armed group that was ostensibly fighting for the marginalized Acholi people in the north of Uganda, but really very quickly turned against its own people. And it's very famous, and maybe you have come across some of these images for, first of all, abducting children into becoming soldiers, or not just children, also adults, for mutilating people and for creating this, you know, with huge human humanitarian emergency in the north of northern Uganda, where from the kind of late 80s onwards, really the entire population was put into what was called so-called protected villages, which really were camps, you know, that you could call them maybe concentration camps. People, have, scholars have called them that. And that because of the violence of the Lord's Resistance Army, this intractable conflict and humanitarian crisis occurred in the north of Uganda. That is one very common way to tell the story. A very common way to talk about Connie is that he is this crazy madman who seems to have supernatural 
military powers that allow him to keep all of this going for a long time and who speaks to spirits and takes his guidance from spirits. A very, very prominent characterization of him. Another way to tell the story would be to say out of these very tumultuous political times in northern Uganda, marginalization of a particular group of people was created. That group of people decided that somehow they needed to resist and mandated at the time a young man and a group of people around him to represent this resistance and sent them off with this mandate to say you need to con continue to defend us against the government, a government that was increasingly putting structures into place that was structural violence that made sure that the population was controlled, for example, by putting them into these camps, which were ostensibly protecting people from LRA attacks, but really were prisons in which the army was controlling where people were living. <laughs> and this is the kind of other side of the story that in a way takes seriously that at the heart of all of this is a political resistance. And this is a very, this sounds like an obvious point to make. It actually is a really, really controversial point to make. Um, and so throughout this time from 1986 onwards, even though the LRA was very, you know, became this mythical force very quickly, they were very invisible. They were very brutal in their attacks. It really also started almost from the beginning that there were attempts at peacemaking. So various uh, mediators, various organizations, various bridges were always being created across with, with LRA fighters. And of course, also people, you know, one of the phenomena was that people moved in and out of LRA membership because they were also very entwined with the population. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. But what's really important to keep in mind is that there was always these attempts at peacemaking. And then in 2005, 2006, one of these attempts really came to fruition after a Dutch peacemaking organization, um, Pax Christi, IKV Pax Christi, for years had tried to establish the right contacts and try to kind of get to the leadership to Joseph Kony said, let's try and find a way to negotiate this. And so these, these talks then started in 2006, the Ugandan government after some pressure and some umming and oing uh, decided to join. They were conducted in Juba, which was the capital of South, now the capital of South Sudan, then Southern Sudan. And they lasted for about a year and a half in which a lot happened. A lot of agreements were signed, ceasefire agreements, demobilization agreements for the LRA fighters, um, a lot of debate on political solutions. And then in a, about a year and a half later of a lot of stopping and very inter interesting stories, which I will tell you about, there was only one thing left to do which was for Joseph Kony to sign a kind of umbrella document that said that he, as the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, was endorsing all of the previous agreements. So after that long time of negotiations, that was the signature that was missing. And so then that signature was supposed to be obtained in this slightly bizarre um, party-like atmosphere where lots of UN helicopters and dignitaries descended on a little village just on the border between South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of the Congo with a little bit of walking involved into the bush. And Kony was supposed to emerge from the bush for the first time for many to be seen as a human being and sign this agreement. And he didn't emerge, he didn't come. And people waited for a week, for 10 days. And he said he couldn't, find, he couldn't sign the agreement. He couldn't trust the agreement. And from then on, this gigantic effort unraveled. And about six months later, the Ugandan army with support of American military advice and um, the, and well, a little bit of the South Sudanese army launched an airstrike on what they knew to be the camp of the LRA in Garamba Forest in Congo. The LRA had been warned before they had scattered. And since then the LRA has been kind of in pockets roaming in that part of the world. So all of this, a very dense period of time of which I spent most of it in Juba or in the areas where the negotiations were being held. And this is by kind of complete coincidence. I kind of stumbled into this and then just stuck with it and made this my PhD research to try and understand what the perspective of the much vilified armed group was and being a participant in these kind of peace negotiations. What was it like for an, an armed actor like the Lord's Resistance Army who had been so isolated also from all these international mechanisms that all of a sudden were thrown at them to go through this very, very complicated process. And so what that means is that what I'm presenting to you and the way I tell the story is very deliberately methodologically one-sided. I really made, a, it's not possible to do it any other way because during this entire time, I very purposely didn't speak to any representative of any of the other negotiating partners because I wanted to understand the perspective of the armed group. And of course, 
that's already very difficult to do, but I really couldn't break their trust by being seen to be talking to other groups. And so I, I make this point straight away to say it's very deliberately one sided. This is not the idea isn't to tell a balanced story here. The idea is to say, how was this experienced by one of the actors? And why, from their point of view, did this not work? And this was an interesting methodological challenge also because throughout this whole time, I never knew whether I was looking at a successful peace talk, so whether all the pieces I was observing were ultimately going to lead up to something great, or whether I was looking at failure. So it's actually very hard to then understand what, how you're judging something. But then sometime halfway through, or sometime, I don't know, I realized that actually maybe from everything that I was seeing and hearing from people, this idea of failure and success for this kind of peace process was probably not a very useful framing, that it was too black and white, too binary to say this is either a successful or an unsuccessful process. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'll pick up two little things from this broader piece of research. I'll talk about one particular dynamic that I experienced with the LRA that made it very, very difficult for the international kind of attempts and machinery to connect with the way the LRA went into this. And then I talk a little bit about, about the inner logic of the LRA and how they, how they framed their own identity, their own understanding of what they were bringing to the table. Um, so those are two bits and pieces I will give you today. Hmm, maybe. Yes. So the first mechanism I want to talk about is what I call the LRA connect disconnect state mechanism, really. And I will talk about what that is, and then I will explain what I mean when I say it meets galvanic surges. So this is how we still think about peace processes. So the idea of peace processes is very often that there's some sort of streamlined version of events. And then there's one spoiler who breaks the pattern and who makes it all go wrong. And so a lot of peace process analyses actually goes and asks that very question, who are the spoilers? Because it's always assumed that there's something very mechanistic that you can pick out. And what that also means is that if you have the notion of a spoiler, it means that you also have some sort of maybe unwritten coda or codex of what negotiation behavior should look like, right? You can only spoil a code that you know exists, right? Otherwise, you're not a spoiler. You just behave in a particular way. And this expected negotiation behavior was exactly what the LRA couldn't bring to the table because they had no idea what that could have even been, nor I would argue would have had from their point of view, would it have served them very well? And what is the image that I use to explain this? With this image, I take you back to the so-called War of the Currents, which was the war between Tesla and Edison in 1880. And the difference between Tesla and Edison was that they thought about electric current in very, very different way. So Edison had this idea that you needed to have direct current, which was very powerful, and traveled in one direction but then ultimately run out of steam. Whereas Tesla had the idea that you have alternating current, right? That you need to kind of refresh the energy by going back and forth. And I find this, this image of the direct and alternating current actually very, very helpful in understanding LRA negotiation behavior because Tesla's alternating current goes in two different directions. It goes back and forth, but ultimately it is more powerful in the long run. Ultimately, it does keep you going over a long period of time because it never overloads the circuit, right? It always pulls back from this. And today, obviously, we do use both currents because they do different things, but Tesla and Edison are actually a very, very useful way to understand the discrepancy between LRA negotiation behavior and the kind of international peacemaking machinery that I think is not well suited for these kind of um, peace processes. And I want to, this is the map that I promised you. And I want to show you just how big the area was that the LRA never controlled territory as such, but covered, right, in which they were present. So it goes all the way from Uganda at the bottom, Acholi land, and then it went into the first eastern equatoria of South Sudan, and then all across into to western equatoria, and then into the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and now even further north, the Central African Republic, and even South Darfur. So that's a huge area for an, for, you know, an armed group that has limited support, although they had some support um, to cover. And the only reason why they were able to do this was, I would argue, because they had this alternating current mechanism. They progressed, they functioned on varying the intensity of their engagement. And this also meant that they engaged with civilian populations in these areas in very different ways. So sometimes they engaged with civilian populations in the most brutal kind of way, by attacking, by abducting people, by killing people, 
At other times, though, in the alternating current back and forth, they settled quite peacefully in some of these areas. And you know, I've, I've visited many villages where people recall when the LRA moved in and started buying things in the market and trading and bartering and marrying and all these kind of things. So again, you have these two different ways of engaging, right? This brutality, but also this coexistence, which is very, very indicative really of also how the LRA interacted with the Atoli population in Northern Uganda, where there was very often a very tight connection and then sometimes it, it broke down again. And the, the way I think about this is in, this, in these two modes, right? In the connect and disconnect mode. The connect mode is moving in and living with the civilian population. The disconnect mode is then attacking. But actually these two aren't binary modes either. I think for the LRA, both of them are ways of engaging and actually showing continued connection and showing continued um, presence. And, but different things happen in these modes. So if you are in this connect mode where they live with the civilian population, they forged relationships, they became more settled, maybe they took the time to regroup and so on. But then when they disengage, when they went into violent mode, actually that is as much a state of engagement and connecting as just a different manifestation of that. It didn't weaken how they presented themselves, how they connected, it just took a different time. And very often these disconnect times were really important times of redefinition for the LRA, of thinking about what move they would do next, what grievance they were most focused on at that particular point in time. And so, with that, um, I want to cast our memories back to Dominique Ongwen at the, at the International Criminal Court, because of course the International Criminal Court made all of this much more complicated. Once the arrest warrants had been issued against Ongwen and four other commanders, including Joseph Kony himself, all of a sudden a trench had been drafted, right? Because for the international community, it became very, very difficult to be seen to engage with people who were under arrest warrant by the International Court in any way. And what it also made, it's it much more difficult to take into account this inner logic of the LRA, this inner logic of this connect and disconnect, which meant that at any point in time, even during the most brutal moments, there was probably a possibility for an entry point to talk about how to resolve this conflict. And this is very counterintuitive, right? This is not how people think about how an armed group exists. Um, but then something interesting happened when the warrants were issued, because the LRA's first reaction was incredulity, and then the second was, we don't really know what this is about. And the first, when I spoke to the, the second in command for the first time, Vincent Oti, he actually laughed and he said, well, no, I understand what it is. I know that they take me to The Hague and they will publicly hang me. That was his understanding of what this arrest warrant against him meant. But then very quickly, they moved to another way of thinking about this, which was a much more kind of connect way. Because they thought, okay, so if there's now this umpire in The Hague, this, this institution that gets to judge us, then all we need to do is take our own evidence of atrocity of the Ugandan army against the Acholi population to them. And obviously any judge will look at this evidence and will go, oh, okay, you had no other choice. You had to, you had to act violently because your people were under attack from this, from this government force. And so they, for a very long time, when this all started, had the idea they would just travel to The Hague and that the judge would listen to them and weigh it up and say, okay, this is, this is um, we understand and you're now exonerated. So weirdly enough, even though the ICC warrants are often framed as being this push factor for the LRA to be going to the table because they thought they had no more out, way out, it kind of was this push factor, but in a different way. They thought, finally, somebody's actually going to listen to our side of the story. And some finally, they saw this broader moment where they could um, use this connect, disconnect mechanism also outside this mysterious depiction of themselves as this, as this rebel force. And this is a picture of, of Kony on the, my right and one of the Acholi leaders, Rod Achana. And it very much depicts this disconnect connect mechanism because throughout this entire time, it wasn't as if there wasn't ever any connection between, for example, Acholi leadership and the LRA. And the, you know, they're very periodically met. This is during the peace talks. But again, it's important to understand that this wasn't this breakdown of relationships, but it's a very different kind of set of relationships, which is very, very difficult and very difficult to navigate. And I really don't want to downplay how brutal this conflict has been and how many people have been killed and how many people have suffered because of this. But it is still important to remember that this is much more interconnected than it, than it is often seen. And so this, this notion of the maybe perhaps for a while the world's most inaccessible and elusive rebel group 
really doesn't work for the LRA. From their point of view, they've never not been engaged in peace undertakings and peace endeavors. They've never not been connected to the community. And really that connection has only ended from their point of view with that military strike on their camp, which was unexpected, even though they'd been warned, but as a kind of broader development, it was unaccepted. And so what has always seemed from the outside as an accessibility, it really just expresses very different, oops, sorry, different kinds of engagement from in, from inside. And so what this also means, and I mentioned this before, this expected negotiation behavior, was that the negotiation behavior that they then displayed during the peace talks was very, very confusing to people, right? Because the peace talks had been kind of set up with this notion internationally, well, there's a group of people under arrest warrant by the ICC. The fact that they're even allowed to come to the table and negotiate is a little bit of a gift, right? So really, they should take the scraps of whatever they can get, because this is a pretty good deal that they're even there. From the LRA's point of view, that was never the case, because that's not how they saw themselves. They didn't see this as a one opportunity. It was just a continuation of a long series ones. And so they went into this with a genuine endeavor to say, okay, we're now going to negotiate in the image of what we think the international community offers to us, which is along the parameters of the liberal peace, right? So the, along the parameters of saying, okay, so there's a political conflict here. Can the party negotiate power sharing, a very popular way of resolving conflicts, right? Can the parties negotiate free and fair elections? Can the parties negotiate that one armed group that gets integrated into the national army? Again, all of these are models that exist in other conflicts that were kind of laughed out the door when it came to the LRA because the suggestion to integrate the LRA into the National Army seemed absurd, but it was a genuine approach to the LRA who just saw themselves as a legitimate armed actor. And so with this notion, they then connected to these the international machinery that very reluctantly, but then quite quickly kicked into place. And all of a sudden, it was very clear that these rules weren't universally applicable, that actually, despite the kind of fanfare of the peace negotiations and this international setup, really the idea that the LRA was going to negotiate power sharing, that Joseph Kony was going to become the 70s vice president, which again is a model that exists, um, wasn't, um, wasn't on the table. And so this, they went into this with this idea of transformation and then very quickly realized the transformation actually wasn't on the table, that this was simply a kind of almost pacification effort. And I think this is a very nice quote from one of the delegates at the time that expresses that the, the transformation that they were trying to pursue was actually denied by the very same externalities that had facilitated the move towards this, this setup. Um, so the analogy of the river of stopping but not being allowed to cross, right? This also, the idea of this flowing river and crossing is this, projects this linear experience of the talk that sits very much at odds with the idea of connect and disconnect. And that takes us back to the direct current. And that's, of course, what the international community brings, the direct current. And this is kind of the image that, for me, best exemplifies of how, and I, you know, this is a very generalizing statement when I use international community, so you have to give, forgive me for that, but broadly, that actually this, this is how that part of the equation work, which is teamwork, right? Coming together, finding consensus, pulling on the same string to create momentum that then becomes unstoppable. And this notion of continuously developing momentum and consensus is really important because ultimately the international community needs to find ways to cut its own corners, right? It has set up a network of rules, like for example, issuing arrest warrants against people who they then bring to the table to negotiate. And there isn't a framework, there isn't an actual legal framework to deal with that situation. So you have to find ways to cut your own corners. How do you do that? By creating this, right? By trying to bring everyone together and create what I call the galvanic surge. So all of a sudden, this is what the direct currents best captures, right? This never stopping momentum, traveling in one direction, increasing its power. And that really, this concentrated energy flow then creates situations like this. Like the UN helicopter landing in the middle of, you know, in the middle of the bush in this village that full of people who didn't know what would hit them really. But that's when the international community functions best. When all of a sudden broad consensus seems to be achieved, uh, seems to be achieved, and there's like a goal is within reach. And actually something very interesting happens when this teamwork moment happens, which is that the more people jump on it, the more funding is easier to access. So all of a sudden for NGOs, it becomes a lot easier to do their work. 
all of a sudden NGOs come together to issue one joint advocacy message. The policy environment is much more easily convinced and all of a sudden these corners are being cut. All of a sudden, somehow the International Criminal Court is being put to the side and doesn't issue press releases anymore. There's kind of this weird thing that happens. Um, and this is very problematic that when success seems probable, more and more people come on board. And more and more people search for loopholes in their own rule book. But the problem that that creates, it sits very uncomfortably with the perspective of the LRA, because that is exactly what the international community needs to function. And that is exactly what for the LRA is very, very suspicious, because all of a sudden, this wash you, there's this galvanic surge washes over them. And it's very clear that they are no longer in control of anything. They just become a play ball. And the worst thing that for them can happen is to no longer be in control, to no longer be in control of their narratives, their actions. And so what happens? After everyone has jumped on the bandwagon, here's a very nice picture of a bandwagon, which means when a deal is likely, the talks get supported. When a deal is likely, the LRA gets scared because they say, well, wait, we're losing, we're losing our grip here. So they go into disconnect, they withdraw, which then sends the signal to the international actors they are not serious, they're regrouping, they're rearming. And then all of a sudden, the international access very quickly, the bandwagoning breaks down as well, which then for the LRA sends the signal, they weren't serious in the first place. They were trying to trick us. This tricking is very, very, um, is very, very a strong narrative. And this is again what I mean when I say the LRA didn't to, to display expected negotiation behavior, right? They weren't going along with the galvanic search, with the consensus creating, because for them it was very, very suspicious. Now, why do we keep seeing this galvanic search moment and this really ever repeating pattern that the, the bandwagon starts getting louder and louder, the more likely something seems to happen? This is why, because ultimately the imagination of what a peace deal looks like is still this, right? It is still bringing the parties together, handshaking, and seemingly that is the moment in which things are resolved, even though we know that that at best is the moment when things move into the next chapter. But what is really important in this is Clinton in the middle, the figure of Clinton, the power that that image holds of being the one person to stand in the middle and bring the parties together is incredibly seductive. It really is. I cannot over uh, overemphasize how seductive that is. And the LRA knows, knew how seductive that was, how much people wanted to be that person. And so much so that there's this wonderful quote that somebody gave me from, from a UN um, who had worked in Uganda previously, not during the peace talks actually, who told me that every time the international donor community got together and you can compile and said, well, right, all of us know we have LRA contacts. We now all agree, nobody will send air to, you know, phone credit anymore. Nobody will send phones. We all now work together because we, you know, we need to show a united front and whatever. And then every single time, the moment they left the room, everyone went off and called their contacts, right? And that is because of this, because that image of being Bill Clinton, of being, as this person said, the one person who walks out of the forest and say, come on, Joseph, we're ending this war now. It is so incredibly seductive that it, as this person says, and I'm just quoting here, it makes people stupid. And so what happens then is, this is the best image that I can use to describe it, is that you create what I call syncopated music, right? And it means that the facilitators on the one hand and the other on the other hand never hit the same rhythm. They always kind of go one after the other. And if you are able to listen to syncopated music and enjoy it, that might be a wonderful way of thinking about it. It is not a helpful image for an international community that needs the teamwork and the, the consensus. But this image really is a very useful one to keep in mind of why these moments never seem to gel. And it was very, actually, one of the negotiators said, um, which I was very delighted about, said that this really, they were so puzzled throughout this entire process. Why on earth the LRA always, when it seemed so close to success, would withdraw? And it really was frustrating and they couldn't make sense of it. And that for him, actually seeing it like this and understanding that this was just a beat, it wasn't the final withdrawal, was a really, really helpful way of, of looking at it. So, of course, what happens in all these dynamics that I've um, that I've outlined is that every single time that piece of trust gets broken, that piece of suspicion gets created, it makes it much, much more difficult to come back, right? And, and basically every new round of talks starts from a new trust building exercise. So again, it's very, very difficult to find your feet. I'm gonna very briefly um, talk about 
the inner logic of the LRA. Um, to give you a sense of also how I've experienced this, and I call one of the chapters is called Am I an Animal? And I give you here the cover of the book again, because the book is a drawing that the second in command made in my notebook, which is the coat of arms of the LRA. So Vincent Oti um, uh, drew this and he, he draws the national bird of Uganda, the crane, and then he draws the palm fronds for peace, signifying peace. He draws a heart with the 10 commandments to signify religious and devotion. And all of this he drew in my notebook in the most meticulous way. And in fact, I'll show it to you because I took a picture. So he had colored pencil in the middle of the bush and he had little sticks of wood that he used as a ruler. And actually, if you go to the book and you see that there's a line, a very thin guiding line to make sure that this was absolutely symmetrical. And he drew this and he explained every single meaning of this and expressed to me that this was all the beautiful things that the LRA stood for, all its values. And of course, none of this resonates with how anyone else perceives the LRA, this idea that there's a strong shared identity that is value driven, that wants peace, that wants love, that wants unity across Uganda is, is completely irrelevant for most people. But for the LRA, this is a very, very important part of how they think about themselves, their own values, their vulnerability, and their very deep ethos that they continue to be the only group that has continuously resisted a very, very hostile government is very um, important. So what that also meant is that with this pride came a real danger to be seen as weak. And this is another quote that I think is, is useful, which is from Connie himself, um, when he describes how he experienced this being part of the peace talks. And it expresses this giving up a lot of one's own identity to open up, to succumb to an external process, but doing so at the great danger of being weak, of losing one's own identity. And so I, th I find this very indicative of how they experience this as a one-sided giving up of their own power. Um, I'm going to race through a couple of things very quickly because this giving up of one, one's own power and weakness and so on is a really important part of the inner logic of the LRA. And one of the ways that I think about this is that actually, while the LRA on the one hand is a really deep network of trust, actually its main strength is that it's also a really deep network of distrust. It continued its own connect-disconnect mechanism, not just with the outside world, but actually internally as well. And the relationship between these two men, commander number one, commander number two, is indicative of this, that actually they stayed together for such a long time because they continuously mistrusted each other to the point that Kony, in the end, did have Vincent Oti killed on his orders because he thought Vincent Oti had overstepped the line and had engaged too much with the outside world. So this is another very interesting thing to realize that this connect-disconnect mechanism also is what kept the organization going. It wasn't just the outside world. One point that I want to make about dignity and about how people want to also present themselves to the outside world and also how much of a novelty it was for the LRA to all of a sudden be in this kind of spotlight is a very touching element for me. So this, this is a picture that I took when I met them for the first time. And I don't know if you can see it, it's a bit light here, but look at Vincent, who's the gentleman on, the le on my left, and look at his hair, because that's how he had just come out of the jungle. And then the peace talks continue and there's more and more international visitors and so on. And then there's the announcement that Vincent was going to give an actual press conference. So reporters came and Al Jazeera came and Uganda papers came. And then Vincent emerged from the bush like this. And it continues to be a complete mystery to me how he managed to get hair dye <laughs> in the middle of the bush. And, but it also is it's so touching and unique to me that that is what he paid attention to, that he wanted to be seen as a young man and not as somebody who had maybe wasted his life away and aged badly in, in, the, in the bush. So this to me is a, is a real indicator of also just how little the international attempts at making peace understand that giving yourself up, giving up your identity as this armed group, presenting yourself in a new way that you think speaks more to a broader narrative, how big of how big of a cost that is. And I want to end this with another quote from Pony, which was kind of indicating that they realized how difficult this endeavor was actually becoming. And he talks about 
his experience of the peace talks. And very quickly, and this is just a few months in, he talks about that actually it appears to be that they've become hostage to their own pursuit, that they reached out, that they connected, right? They actually use that language. We reach out a hand to connect and they were immediately robbed of their own presence, power and dignity and put in the weakness basket. And that they, at this point in time, already could only lose out. And for him at this point already, it was very clear that this wasn't going to lead to what they had imagined to be this kind of universal peace and political process, but that it actually had already turned into something very, very different. That wasn't, that he himself couldn't call uh, peace anymore. So with that, sorry, I've gone on long, I'll stop. Thank you. If you have a question, you can raise your hand and I'll bring the mic around. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I think it was very, very interesting. I have a, a question about um, the role of empathy and the empathy that you had to exercise yourself in this case there's this dominating narrative of the LRA being, um, a, well, yeah, a, a really bad group. I and mean, we can objectively say that many actions that they committed were atrocious, uh, but you, you show with this narrative, the importance of having empathy uh, so that we can actually understand what the conflict is. I wonder how this was for yourself. How were you able to, to create that empathy and kind of like fight back the dominating narrative that was around it. And if you ever, I, I guess, um, you had that conflict with yourself with that. Thank you. Should we take a few or shall I take each in turn? Thank you. Oh uh, yeah, um, so I was curious like, um, what, what do you think it is, like, what do you think the factors are specifically that made um, the LRA to be like a group that is so like universally disliked and universally condemned? Because like, I can think of like several other groups that are, you know, widely, widely condemned as severely as the LRA was by like maybe half of the world population. And then the other half will view them as like, oh no, like they have just about action and they'll even give them support. Like there's a group in, um, Lebanon called Hezbollah that like is uh, widely widely condemned by the West, but Iran and other Shia communities think that it's actually a good effective group. For example, um, and I'm struggling to understand like if like the LRA it seems pretty unique in being you know so universally like they don't even have like a sector of uh, the world that yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, I was wondering, um, this notion of uh, connect, disconnect, was this something that you pieced together in hindsight? Or could you see it happening in real time, the gas shifting and, and uh, this happening while you were on the ground? Or was it um, what you put together after the fact? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Should we do one more and then? Okay. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. So in terms of understanding how your research applies to future efforts, how do you think, a, what do you think a more successful way would have been for the international community to approach the LRA? Like what, how could they have better come to the table? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Oh, fantastic questions. Thank you. Um, Empathy, yeah, very, very tricky one. You asked whether I had to fight back my own or just that too, I'll get to that in a second, but actually it was very hard to be um, the one person telling the story about, you know, not the only person who thinks about it this way, but maybe telling it at that point in time in the slightly different framing. And during COVID, Coney 2012, I did not have a happy life because I really, I really didn't clock how my perspective was so vastly different. And I can tell you the internet trolls are real, right? So all of a sudden I was, I mean, I was just hit with this wave of hatred of people who 
I, I had never known their existence and neither had they known of mine, right? So actually that already was a, a kind of a dip in the toe of what happens when you tell a story in a different way. And of course, I, and again, I, I stress this, right? I don't, I don't sugarcoat the violence. The violence has been horrific, but the violence has also been on all sides and very, very nuanced um, in, in the way it's been um, experienced. But my own empathy is an interesting question because I think actually for me, because the way I encountered the people, the humanity was very center stage for me. And that was interesting because a lot of the early encounters were very humorous because, I mean, I, I, again, I didn't clock them. Sometimes I can be really slow on the uptake, but I didn't clock this. For me, this, me walking into the bush to meet these people was like completely unique and completely bizarre and so strange that I couldn't put my words to it. But it took me a while to understand that if for them it was just as strange that I was there, right? So actually what I encountered was this mutual curiosity, right? And, <clears throat> excuse me, and in a way, of course, I, I, they opened up to me. So it wasn't, I was very sure that I wasn't under any threat, right? I was very certain that this was a connect moment, even though at the time I hadn't yet developed that concept. But this mutual curiosity of humans was very, very noticeable to me. And that is often covered with humor, right? And with laughter. So actually a lot of these encounters were, were quite humorous. And then people very quickly, I mean, the LRA, when you speak to individuals, they're not shy about outlining the contradictions of their own existence, right? It's a very kind of also actually quite frank conversation. So I never encountered this moment where I kind of, had to remind them also of what they had done, even though they might not say that more broadly in public. So again, that to me made the empathy easier because it was very clear to me that this was a very contradictory, struggling, difficult life story and which you know, many, many of the LRA members, especially the ones who had been in the bush for 20 years said, I didn't want my life to be this way. There's one commander who said, I can tell you exactly the day at 4 p.m. I said goodbye to my mother and I walked into the bush and I joined the LRA because I knew, I knew we needed to read this, but I thought I was gonna be back two years later. And this was you know, 24 years ago. Or another commander was saying, he was a um, saxophone, or both saxophonist, I think, in the army band. He was, a lot of them had been in the army before. And really all he wanted to do was get back to this, right? Somebody asked me for a dictionary because they wanted to retrain their vocabulary and so on. So nobody was there and said, this was my dream existence, right? But a lot of them had this idea that this was the, the lot that they had been dealt and they now had to deal with that lot. So that again, to me, make, made it a lot easier to connect in that way. Um, whether, why is the LRA so universally disliked is a really interesting question. So there's, I think, very various bits to this, right? One is they really weren't very good at stating their grievances. And there, I mean, there's a very concerted, there's a fantastic Swedish scholar, uh, Sveka Finstrom, who's written at length about this, how particularly in the early days of the conflict, the government very meticulously suppressed any kind of communications from, from the LRA. So, but they weren't very good in using any kind of, you know, some of the manifestos are written very crudely and they kind of make very generic statements and so on. And the reason why they weren't very good was explained to me by one of the fighters, um, that Vincent Ortiz, who was kind of the intellectual head, couldn't be cook, cashier, and waiter at the same time. And that he would have been the only person who really could have put some of these things into writing. And he, he didn't, right? And then, but again, Sverker Finstrom has collected a lot of the early manifestos and there's actually a lot more around, um, but they were also very, very um, deliberately suppressed. And then the LRA in its own inner logic of connect, disconnect, turned against its own population. And that this is when things become very modeled, but very solid within the logic, because they felt that even though that population had mandated them to go into the bush and be the resistance, the population wasn't displaying the right level of resistance against the government. And they felt that they'd left, been left alone, that they had become traitors. And so traitors need to be punished. And that moment in time is of course the definitive moment when for the LRA, the logic is really watertight for the rest of the world. It makes no credibility is lost, right? If you say I'm fighting for the liberation of the Acholi people and I'm doing so by attacking the Acholi people, that is a really difficult logical reasoning to follow. In the inner logic of the LRA, it makes a lot of sense, but all of these things play together. And then some of these mechanisms that I described, right? None of the none of the expected behavior was displayed by the LRA, which makes them then even more unlikable. And this was very st strong in the peace talks because they were so much 
imagined to be a favor to the LOA. In fact, that's an, a verbatim quote from one of the negotiators of the LOA saying, we never moved beyond this idea as, as a favor to us. So, you know, anything that was offered to us, we should have taken. And the fact that we didn't makes us even worse. So it really is a clash of the inner logic, some of the, the kind of structural um, suppression, and then also the LOA not being very good. Because again, for them, the reasons for resistance are so crystal clear that they almost assume that they don't need to tell anyone. In fact, they said that to me, right? The fact that you're even asking us means you are ignorant rather than we have not communicated this well to you. Um, and then the next question, Shia from um, Connect is Connect. Did I see this or did I piece it together? So I, during, because I didn't know whether I was looking at a success or a failure, right? So I, do, I took really, really meticulous notes every night that I was there observing, I sat down and I wrote pages and pages of notes. And then I did, some people in the room will laugh, grounded theory over months and months and months. And you then look at patterns and you say, what, are, what explains some of these processes? So at some point, the contradiction became clear to me um, when the rest of the world, you know, the Ugandan papers were headlining, LRA drops out of talks, talks are over. And all the LRA negotiators were like, no, this is going really well. And you think, I don't know how this works, but it's very clear this contradictory experience, right? And then, yeah, you over months, and in my case, years, um, you kind of start piecing this together and you say, what actually is a theoretical concept that can help explain? And I mean, uh, yeah, it's not, I'm not joking when I say years because I kind of parked it for a long time and then went back to it because I wanted to see, I, I needed to go back to Uganda to do some field work because I wanted it to be relevant still and that took a while for me to do that. Um, but, you know, in a, in a way that was helpful because I could see how this continued to play out. So, yeah, this is, this is the very meticulous process of trying to develop a theory from some of your empirical observations. And then the last one, future effects for future peace talks and what, what, how should they have come to the table? And really the only way I can think about this is they shouldn't come to a table, right? You can't think of this, if you really take this connect, disconnect and galvanic search seriously and the tension that that creates, you actually cannot galvanize it around a moment that inevitably will lead to Clinton and, um, and Arafat. Um, so, you know, Tanya Paffenholz writes about this, about perpetual peace building, that really peace processes cannot be demarcated in space and time, and they certainly can't be to a deadline. But that is very difficult for an international community that since then the UN has set up a standby mediation unit, right, which very literally does exactly that. They fly in and they are the mediators and they hammer out the agreements. And then, of course, you know, you, you don't need to go far to look at scholarship of what happens after a peace agreement, which is inevitably the conflict goes into the next phase. Inevitably, a peace agreement that seems like this moment of resolution actually becomes a moment of calcifying existing structures, right? Because whatever gets put into place at that moment in time is based on the structures that were powerful during the conflict. It's, it's not transformative in that way. So you, you, you create the next spiral and make things worse. So for me, a really helpful and very um, naive sounding idealistic image would be to say, to not have a negotiation table, right? And to find out what it is actually that conflict resolution needs to look like if it is genuine about not doing it for some sort of photo op moment, which then galvanizes this, this moment in time. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you so much for a wonderful presentation.